everyone, and welcome to our Impact on Sports on today's quest for equality and social justice panel. You know, throughout time, sports in America has proven to be a bit of a lightning rod when it comes to athletes and coaches using their platforms to speak against injustice and raise awareness. We have often seen these very platforms rescinded in an effort to quell the efforts, but like Muhammad Ali in the 60s, John Carlos, Tommy Smith, Kurt Floyd, and Mahmoud abdul Raouf and Craig Hodges in the 90s, and most recently Colin Kaepernick in 2016. Athletes are going to say what they need to say, and the efforts to quiet them will continue to go unfulfilled. I'm very happy to have joining me today as your host, my name is Greg Kelser, five very successful coaches here in the state of Michigan, all highly decorated. I'd like to introduce them. I just pulled out a couple of thumbnail sketches in there as part of their bios. I won't go very deep because we'll be here all night, but I want to start with Juwan Howard. He was a member of Michigan's famed Fab Five. He's played 19 years in the NBA, won a couple of championships, and now the head coach back at his alma mater, the University of Michigan. Coach Howard, we welcome you. Thank you, Greg. Also, Greg Campy who's guided the Oakland Grizzlies for 33 years. He's won 632 games. He's been the coach of the year in both the Summit and Horizon Leagues multiple times. And he is a member of the Michigan Sports Hall of Fame, Coach Greg Campy from Oakland University. So happy to have him join us. Mike Davis, very successful stints as a coach at Indiana, University of Alabama, Birmingham, Texas Southern. He's taken all of those programs to the NCAA tournament. Of course, in 2002, he was a Big Ten Coach of the Year and was able to get the Indiana Hoosiers to the national championship title game. And uh, Coach Izzo, Coach Tom Izzo, a Naismith Basketball Hall of Famer, has won 628 games all at Michigan State, where he's coached since 1994. He's a two-time National Coach of the Year. He's won 10 Big Ten championships, and he's guided the Spartans to eight Final Fours winning the championship in 2000. And then finally, Coach Dwayne Casey. It's Coach Dwayne Casey, who's the reason why Michigan State doesn't have one more national championship because he played on the Kentucky Wildcats 1978 national championship team that put us out of the tournament a week before we could get to our crowning glory. Coach Casey has coached since 1979 in various capacities, but he's been a head coach with the Minnesota Timberwolves as an assistant with Dallas in 2011. He captured an NBA championship. And from there, he was able to guide the Toronto Raptors to the brink of a championship while capturing the 2018 NBA's Coach of the Year Award, currently head coach of the Detroit Pistons and the catalyst for tonight's panel. So, gentlemen, I welcome you all, and uh, we'll get started here. I wanted to give you all an opportunity just to say a few words uh, at the beginning here about why it's important for you to be a part of this panel and how you've been able to use the platform, the lofty platform that you have right now as a leader of young men of different ethnicities. How have you been able to do that? And again, why is it why is it important for you to be on this panel tonight to talk about the things that we're confronted with in America? Let's start with you, Coach Izzo. Well, I, I just think it's very important. You know, I came from an area of our state that there are no black people in the UP, you know, especially when I was growing up. And, and the first black man I met was Mike Garland, who's still my assistant to this day. And uh, he's been probably my best friend uh, next to Mary Uchi. He's probably a guy that's educated me more. And I think during the Colin Kaepernick thing, I just didn't know what I didn't know. I didn't realize what I didn't know. And I looked at it in a different way when it happened. And then as I watched and I thought back to my days in elementary school, junior high school, when Woodstock and all those things were going on and all these white people were burning flags. And I just think, wow, I'm, I, I got so much more to learn. And I talked to my team about it. And now I want to do something that Probably a bigger than a national championship, and that's do something uh, for the entire country instead of just for a school. Coach Davis, uh, I watched you make what I thought at the time was an incredible 
uh, move and challenge when you took over at Indiana University for the fable Bob Knight under incredible circumstances. Um, but you were able to succeed there in the face of all of that. Tell us about that transition and some of the things you faced in, uh, in, in a climate uh, coming behind a legend like Bobby Knight in Bloomington, Indiana. Well, uh, Indiana was very difficult for me. I've never shared some of the stories uh, that I encountered there in Indiana. Uh, the platform that I want to use now uh, with what's going on with the George Floyd situation is that I think we need more black coaches in the Power Five. We only have eight black coaches in the Power Five. Uh, that's very disappointing for me in 2020. At Indiana, give you a little background for people that know what I went through. Was I was an interim coach, and I became a full time coach. And the new AD that came in uh, didn't offer me a contract until after we had played for a national championship game. But the contract that he offered me was the same money that I made as the interim coach, which was $200,000. And he said that he wanted me to repeat what I just did for playing in the national championship game. And so uh, that was very disappointing. And the next AD came in uh, and his first conversation with me was, uh, I can help you get a job somewhere else. And that was his first conversation. Uh, the next thing was, you know, we're in Indiana and, and when Coach Knight was there, uh, the locker room and the office, everything was the same the way he'd been coaching for a long time. And the new AD made plans to remodel and do everything for the women's basketball team. Build new office and locker room before he did the men's basketball. And so I knew it was time for me to move on, but I was, I was, I, I thought that in 2020 that we would have way more coaches, more black coaches uh, in the Power Five. Uh, purposes. Uh, we don't have a black supervisor for officials, uh, black commissioners over these conferences. And, you know, I just think we're just so far behind right now in, in where we need to be from a black coach's standpoint. And I've said this, you know, if you're a white coach and you might have two black guys on your staff working for you, uh, you should change. And uh, because we have 70% of the black players and, and, and what I went through, I share with every team I've ever had, and they understand it. But a lot of a lot of coaches don't understand what I had to go through uh, to get to this point. And so I'm using this platform. I've been on about three or four Zooms to try to promote. There, are, there's no black supervisor for officials, like like none, zero, in the whole country. Uh, uh, eight power five coaches, black. Uh, we only get 10, less than 10% of the McDonald's all the America are going plan for black coaches. So we need to change that. And this is the platform that I'm trying to use to change. Thank you, Coach. And you mentioned the murder of George Floyd, which happened on the 25th of May. And clearly it sparked enough outrage thrusting America into a bit of a, an international litmus test that is totally inescapable and unavoidable. And Coach, I know that you and others, I'm speaking to Coach Campy now, uh, were so moved, feeling like I've got to do something. You and I, we we marched uh, uh, in downtown Detroit not too long ago. I was happy to see you there because I feel like this is not just uh, a black issue. This is an American issue. This is a human, uh, a human decency issue. And uh, tell us what has motivated you at this time. Well, Greg, I, I, I agree. I was glad you were there too. It was it was good to see, you know, the basketball community come out in Detroit. Uh, I think the Michigan Coaches Association, uh, Basketball Coaches Association, put the the march together. So uh, I was great to see coaches come out there, uh, see you out there. Um, you know, I, I truly believe that the basketball locker room is one of the most sacred places there is um you know when you have a team and you have to achieve together i think sports can be uh something that the, the country can look at and see how a team of people from different race different cultures can come together compete succeed love each other 
you know, I, I've seen over the years players from, you know, I grew up in a town, Defiance, Ohio. And as Tom said, you know, I never met a black man until I went to Bowling Green to play football. And I went into the defensive backs uh, meeting room. I was the only person there that looked like me. And, you know, that was a whole different world for me. And in many cases, you know, by the time it's all over, those are some of the best friends I have in my life. And I think that we see that in our in our own teens, a, a kid from someplace out in the middle of nowhere who goes home at Thanksgiving and takes, you know, his teammates home and people that don't look like each other going to different places and becoming brothers for life. And so we have that in our sport. And I think that we as coaches can use that and use that platform to educate people. Now, I, I, I've never gone through what Mike Davis has go, went through and I never will. It, you know, it, that's just a fact. Um, so I can't go out and use my, my platform like Mike can. I, I've got to be completely different. I've got to be a guy that is looking at it from what we've built over the years and what our players and what they've learned and then them going on and educating the world because I, I firmly believe it's an education problem. You know, we're all products of our environment. Every one of us, there's no way around that. It is a product of how you were brought up, who you were surrounded by, how you live. And because of that, educating the other environments to me is, is the way that we can be successful or that I can be part of the movement because the big 12 put out a, a, a big 12 coaches put out a video and I thought it was fantastic. And they said, this is, this is not a moment. This is a movement. And I think we have to believe that and, and follow that. Now coach Howard, and, and I feel kind of funny calling you coach Howard because you know, you're, you're the youngster of this bunch. Uh, I, I can remember even playing against you uh, at, on the basketball court back in the day, but you spent seven years as an assistant coach in the NBA before uh, transitioning to the college ranks. And you just completed your first year as a head coach at the University of Michigan. Just tell us about some of the things you learned, some of the things that perhaps you were not aware of that are the responsibilities of a coach who has to not only coach, but has to use uh, the position that you have to guide, direct, motivate, and uh, hopefully uh, uh, instill the proper attitudes in your players. Well, first of all, Greg, uh, you, know, you don't have to call me coach. You can call me Juwan. You know, we have that relationship. <laughs> I don't think I've earned that right yet for you to call me coach. I still got to put more years in. But first, before I answer your question, I just want to say, you know, to uh, Dwayne Casey, thank you for uh, – Inviting me to be a part of this uh, this forum here, and uh, it's an honor to be amongst these uh, great coaches, very decorated coaches that have done some amazing jobs uh, on the collegiate level as well as on the professional level. Greg, you've been always a you know one of my heroes. I have a lot of respect for you and what you've done over your career. Uh, I love the relationship that we have. But to get to the question, um, you know, being a guy that's from the inner city of Chicago. Grew up on the south side of Chicago, a very tough environment. Um, went to all black, you know, elementary school, all black high school. Uh, didn't didn't get a chance to uh, interact with the uh, the white culture until uh, when I got to college at the University of Michigan. And so now I come back full circle during my time as uh, being a part of that professional level. Now, as a, a head basketball coach for my alma mater, uh, I have a I have a duty. You know, I have a job to uh, perform and uh, to be the, the best leader that is available for our, our youth. Um, I've been a part. I've been a leader throughout my life. Uh, always, you know, from my background, try to do the right thing in life and uh, lead the right path. Yes, I've made mistakes like a lot of other folks, and. Um, Still making mistakes today, and still trying to learn and get better. But the, the beauty of it is, I'm having a, a chance to impact a lot of kids uh, from different backgrounds. Coach uh, can't be touched on, uh, no matter what race they are. If they're white, they're black, uh, Latino, uh, Asian, 
Uh, no matter what, you know, sports is the beauty of it as far as how we've all come together as one. And you're right, Coach Campia, uh, we are the perfect example for this society. But now that I am the leader of this institution, a, a fine institution, um, it's important for me to uh, listen to our, our youth, not how like I have every answer. Um, if I don't have an answer, go find it. Uh, but then more importantly, uh, continue to keep uh, learning from them and, and encouraging our, our youth to uh, use their voice and their platform. And I'm so proud of the fact that we have young leaders uh, at the University of Michigan program that understands the big picture. They're very selfless. Um, and so um, what I'm trying to do is continue to encourage them to use their platform and continue to keep leading out there. Um, being a leader of my community, I want them to be leaders of their community as well. And, and this, this is a beautiful opportunity for our team to be able to go out there and use their, their voice. And they've been doing it and I'm, I've been encouraging them. And we've been having a lot of team meetings, uh, Zoom calls, and I've seen how it's been very productive. And I, I've seen a lot of growth that's coming out of our Zoom meetings. Thank you, Juwan. Uh, Coach Casey, you, again, um, you're, the, you're the reason why we're doing this tonight. You sought um, to keep the conversation going, I think, were your words, and not let this thing lose any of its momentum. You know, I, you and I, one year separates, separates us in age. We were both born in the South. South. We have seen some things, and, you know, one of the things that I've probably been guilty of, and, and that's not really, sh and that's not sharing my, my story, you know, people see you, they see me, and they see what's today, but they don't know what it took to get to today. They don't know some of the issues and some of the, the challenges and, and some of the injustices that that were uh, witnessed, lived, and experienced uh, growing up in the 60s, growing up in the 70s, and what have you. I was really impressed uh, when I read the expose you had in the uh, Detroit News maybe about a month or so ago but it really opened up a window into what Dwayne Casey has had to endure to get to the point where you are today. Uh, so I, I really commend you on doing that, for opening up and sharing that. And, and I'd just like to hear from you. Uh, first of all, again, I wanna thank you for bringing us all together. I think this is gonna be a great learning experience for us all. But I'd like to hear more from you about what motivates you uh, in your quest to be a difference maker in today's, in today's society. Well, Greg, first of all, I want to thank everybody here. It's, it's everybody here on the, on the panel that we have. I have a trend, tremendous amount of respect for what Tom has done in Michigan State, what Juwan's doing to get back home to his alma mater, what, what Greg is doing at Oakland, and, and Mike, what he's done and been through at Indiana. People look at him and don't remember the days of Indiana, but highly successful coaches. And again, people who are leader of men. And uh, I'm just, it's, it warms my heart to sit here and listen to Greg and Tom and Juwan and Mike and yourself, Greg, talk. Uh, and again, you talked about coming from the South. I grew up in segregation. Uh, I didn't integrate schools until I was in the fifth grade. Uh, and that was forced, was forced integration. It wasn't uh, something I chose to do. It was forced on us by the National Guard uh, with guns and where we had to go into the school and escort us in with parents outside with signs saying, hey, we don't want you here. Uh, we don't, we, you don't need to be here. Uh, and then you go inside and the first probably two, three months, uh, I had to fight, you know, and, and people, you know, kids called me the N word and, and I had to fight. But the great thing about that, and we said it earlier, some of those same guys that I got in fights with are still my friends today. Because once we got to playing sports and playing together, uh, all the education that their parents gave them that was wrong about black kids, they have tails, they, blah, 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 you know, don't play with them. They found out different, that I was just like them. I love baseball and basketball just like they did. So the education piece is so huge. And the way we educate our kids, uh, and, and, and that's why when I saw the, the man laying on the ground with a guy with his knee in his neck, I thought about my son. And I was at that same age when I integrated schools and what my son doesn't have to go through, hopefully, 
you know, that man laying on the ground calling for his mother and all of us here, we're, we have close relationships, I'm sure with our moms, it just, it hit me. Uh, it just hit me to, to the fact that what can I do as a coach, as a leader of men uh, to help try to help educate and enlighten people? Because I've, I've been through it all my life, going through it uh, at the elementary, high school level. I was a fifth African-American or sixth, whatever number you want to call it, at the University of Kentucky, which at that time hadn't, it was barely breaking the color barrier at Kentucky. I had just come away from Coach Rupp, who was a great coach, won a lot of games, uh, but uh, didn't, was slow to integrate schools at the University of Kentucky. So we had we struggled that first year, and they said, well, they have too many African-Americans, too many, they, they use a little colorful name, mother than that, but uh, on their team, that's why they can't win. And we were like 13 and 13, but went on to win the NIT. I think it was in 75, 76, I think it was. So again, going through that issue, and then through all the coaching levels, uh, and Mike hit it on the head, and uh, you know, Tom and, and Greg never had to go through this, but you're, you're graded on a different level. You're graded on a different level, and uh, you know, you can win as many games, but you still haven't done enough. And so you have to go through those barriers uh, to get to the next level. But the key thing that we're doing is by having this conversation about a multitude of things that's going on uh, is education. Uh, because there are people like Tom, there are people like Greg, there are people like the people at Fox, and my owner, Tom Gores, who gave, is giving me the, the, the enthusiasm, the passion, and the go-ahead to go ahead and speak out. It's people like that that's gonna help to make change. <laughs> because without the majority speaking up, without Tom Izzo speaking up, without Greg speaking up, without Tom Bull speaking up, without the, the billionaires speaking up, there's not gonna be a change. We can kid ourselves all we want to. That's one reason why in the Coaches Association, in the NBA, we put Greg, uh, Greg Popovich, Steve Kerr, and those guys, Quinn Snyder, in front. Because if I go out and say it, Clem Haskins go out and say it, and people are Nate McMillan, we're just angry black men. But when the majority speaks out with good in their heart, guys like Tom, guys like Greg, guys like Pop, guys like Steve, people listen. And so we have to be strategic about how we get the education piece out there. Uh, and, and that's what this is about. It's not you know, pointing fingers at anybody, but what can we do to affect change? Education, it starts in the elementary school. You know, and we'll get to that a little bit later, but where in the history books do we hear about Black Wall Street, the massacre in South Oklahoma? Where do we hear, read about the Wilmington Lodge, about the neighborhood that was in Wilmington, Delaware, Delaware, Wilmington, no, I'm sorry, North Carolina, where a, a fluent black community was just wiped out? You know, all those things we never learn about in our elementary teachings, our high school teachings, and all those things. So education is a big piece of where we got to start creating change is how we educate our young kids. Guys, I want to ask you, and this is for everyone, uh, just chime in as you will. Um, what is it about this time, though, that makes it feel a lot different? The things that we witnessed on television, as tragic as they were regarding George Floyd, those things have been happening throughout time. And in this day and age with cell phones and video cameras and such, we're able to witness a lot of that. But something was different about this one. And the fact that the momentum against it, the outrage against it has not dissipated at all. It seems to even be gaining momentum. What is it that makes you think that this time will be different than any of the others? Well, Gregory, I'd like to tell you what hit me on that. Uh, I was on a Zoom call on a board that I'm on and Frank Martin was on the call. And Frank and I have become very good friends over the years. And, and Frank said to me, Tom, I do something with my son that you'll never have to do with yours and you never have done with yours. I said, what's that, Frank? He said, every time he leaves the house, he's 17 years old. I tell him to be careful. I tell him to do this. And I said, yeah, me too. You know, worried about drunk drivers, texting, and drugs. And he goes, yeah, I worry about those things. But I worry, I got to tell him how to act in front of a police officer. And I said, what do you mean? You know, what does that mean? And he said, you've never done it. And I said, no, I haven't. 
I've never talked to my kids about any of that. And it was so eye-opening to me. It made me realize that uh, how sad it is that that somebody would have to do that. And I'll bet you, I'll bet you, all you black coaches on this talk um, had to do that with your kids. And I mean, we, we never thought of doing that. Never even crossed my mind on doing that. And, and when that happened, I realized that I've got to step up. Here's what Dwayne said: as a white coach in a predominantly um, black sport, at least the kids I recruit are high majority of inner city kids i've got to be the guy the white guy's got to start standing up because if you're self-promoting it doesn't work as good as Dwayne said and i just felt an obligation my wife's hispanic that led to some of it too where i you know i heard all her stories and her father's stories and and i was embarrassed and ashamed that i haven't stood up earlier and so now it, it's going to be part of it and i i'd like to close on that by saying I hear, I hear people say a lot, I lead by example. And when parents say that to me, my son leads by example, I said, I hate that. I can't stand it. Because leading by example is good if everybody's watching. But I think we got to lead by bringing people with us. we got to lead by, you know, I had some great talks like Juwan did with my team. I had some great talks with you, Greg, with Steve Smith. You know, I went back to Team Cleaves. I tried to take all my former players. and I said, educate this white guy. You know, help me out. You know, and, and so many of us did. And I'm going to be a better coach, a better father, um, a better person because of it. And now we all got the job of winning a national championship or doing a world championship. But I think this is going to be a bigger, bigger of a goal for me. Can I be a difference maker? We're all looking for difference makers. I want to be a difference maker in society, and that's why I jumped in. Yes, sir. Well, I jumped in because, and, and Greg, you and I talked about this that day at the marches. You know, I'm, my family's from Detroit. My mom and dad grew up on Finkel and Strathmore. They went to Cooley High School. Um, you know, I spent a lot of years on, on that street. And I was there in 68, 67, when the riots went off down. And... I remember my grandmother in her broken English, uh, a Romanian lady who had come on the boat here, telling why, what was going on and explaining it to me. And and how many years later now, it, it's happening again. And I think through social media, I think through the cell phone and all the things that exist today, that we can do something. And we have to, it's incumbent on us to stand up and it's incumbent on us to do something. And I heard a man by the name of Brett Fuller. He's a pastor in Washington. And he spoke to the, uh, I'm on a committee with the College Basketball Coaches Association. And um, we're trying to make a change. And, and we're working real hard and some great things. Frank Martin, Martin as Tom was saying, is the head of that committee with Tommy Amaker. And, there's some great things that are gonna come out of this committee. But Brett gave a 45 minute speech to us. It was the best thing I'd ever heard in my life. I was moved more by that speech than anything I've ever heard in my life. And the thing that I took out of that speech that I'm gonna do is, I'm not gonna go up to my players and say, how you doing, you know, hey, I've coached this many black kids in my life. I don't, you know, what he, he advised is you go out and you tell them that I'm not black and I don't know what you've gone through, but I'm here to help you. And I want to hear what you have to say. And then the thing that moved me the most is at the end of the speech, he said, when you're talking to them later, don't go up and ask them, how are you doing? Go up and ask them, how am I doing? You know, and now I, I, I I thought about how am I doing? And I, I just, I was just so moved by that because I mean, I've coached for 42 years in college basketball and I've never walked up to one of my players and said, how am I doing? You know, and uh, I'm will that, that's going to happen this year. And then I'm throwing myself into the committees and, and everything that I can do to stand up. And I firmly believe that, Change is coming.
And I firmly believe that through education and the proper education, I believe that every college student should have to take a black history course because my fuller speech to me was full of history that I didn't know. And I really thought I was a well-educated person and he was saying things I'd never heard of. And so I believe that if we can get every college in this country to demand that their students take a black history course, I think that will go a long way to changing the perceptions and the, in the, as I said earlier, the, the product of our environment. Let's learn about other environments. So there's so many things out there we can do. I'm on board. Can I add to that point right there? Uh, when we talk about solutions, uh, that is one of the solutions right there. You know, making sure there's a required in all universities uh, that there are American, African American history being taught, uh, and it's a requirement. Uh, also, I will go back further than that. Let's take it back to the elementary schools. Let's take it back to the high schools, because I was one of those product of the inner city. And when it started in my elementary school, we had not only Black history for that month, but it was taught as a requirement. And they taught us about our history, about our ancestors and all the impact that they have and make the difference in this world that a lot of my players don't have no clue or no idea about. And that's including the black players too. Um, and so I think it would be so impactful if we would just, you talk about change and implementing a solution, it starts with the education. And because this learned behavior on what some kids are, you know, when it comes to the racism, it's starting at home. It's starting in the school. It's starting with the crowds that they be around, their, their, their uh, inner circles. You know, some of that is being learned because of, because I don't think it's racism is a part of your DNA, you know, because you were born with it. It was because of this learned behavior. And that being said, in my opinion, I think we have to really teach our kids and train their minds to like, hey, you know, this color, this racism thing, we all should be equal. Let's bring it back. And it starts with our youth first, the grading and the education part. You know, Greg and, and Juwan, I, I, I really applaud what you guys are saying as far as, as uh, making it mandatory that history becomes a part of the curriculum. I hope even in high school as well as college. You know, I feel very, very fortunate in that, first of all, I, I, I think I know quite a bit about my history as an African-American. Now, there's still so much more for me to learn. I know this, but I feel very fortunate and Greg Campy, you heard me mention this at the march we were at when I talked to the youngsters. I told them about my great grandmother. Guys, my great grandmother died when I was 15 years old. She was 102. Wow. She was she was born in 1870. She was born five years after the abolition of slavery. So being 15 years old, I was able to experience her. I was able to feel her. I was able to to get a grasp of what it was like to be black in this country in the 1800s. So I have a much steeper, I think, awareness and appreciation of the sacrifices that were made just to get us to this point in time. Um, Dwayne Casey, I was absolutely thrilled when you, along with Arne Tellum, uh, when we were in Washington, D.C. back in February, he took our whole traveling party to the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And let me tell you, what an experience, what an experience. I thank you at the end of that because, again, it, 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 it was uplifting for me. Uh, it was educational for everybody. People were walking through that exhibit with tears in their eyes because they just didn't know certain things. And what it made me appreciate more than anything else, Coach Case, is the fact that you do understand that the platform it's about more than just coaching. It's about more than just basketball. It is about teaching. It is about instilling a uh, certain understanding, certain values, and hopefully appreciation uh, for the past. And um, that that's what came to mind as I listened to uh, Greg and Jawan talk about making African-American history mandatory. I'd love to see that. Well, and with that, you know, that's part of the education. The players didn't even realize the education they were getting at the time. You kind of have to trick them 
as you know, Juwan, to go. But again, that's the beautiful thing about, I think, young people today. They're far more educated than I was at that same age. They, they you know, the instant, the cell phones, the internet, there's so much information out there. You know, they teach me, even though I went through segregation where I had to uh, knock on the back door, put an order in, uh, wait for them to blink the light, and then go pick up my order at the back door, sit upstairs in the movie theaters, couldn't sit downstairs, uh, and, and that type of thing. So they, they thought that the old coach just so old, he's old time and all that. But again, it was part of the education. And uh, I agree with Greg and also Juwan. We've got to get, that's part of what we, the challenge we have is getting the black history, the bad things that have happened that our, our country has done to start, you know, having heal, a healing effect on everybody. Back in elementary, maybe elementary may be a little young, but junior high, high school. But all those things, we've got to get that educational piece in there at that time to help promote uh, what's going on in the future because, uh, but again, I will say I'm proud of our younger generation uh, because they are informed. They are on top of it. You know, I'll get a text or, or whatever from a player on information of stuff that's going on. We had Dr. Michael Dyson speak to our team. I had him speak to our team to talk about the history, about all the things that, that went through with slavery, uh, Jim Crow. And people talk about the system. The system is working. Believe it or not, the system is working. Once slavery, once you did away with slavery, all right, here comes the, okay, I can't legally have you a slave. So what's the best way to get free labor? All right, let's put them in jail. All right, so now here comes, here comes Jim Crow. You look at somebody the wrong way, you go in jail. So now all at once you get free labor, all right, for a dollar a day, whatever. So now what we have to do is change our justice system to make sure we all, everything is, everyone is penalized the right way and for the right reasons uh, and not just to be scooped up and put in jail for no reason at all. And again, that's going to the justice system that we got to change because what happened to slavery, Jim Crow, uh, civil rights and the right to vote uh, is all working perfectly to form the way it was intended to. And, and some, you know, I, I heard Bill Clinton talk about how he didn't mean for the three strikes system to work the way it did. And it incarcerates so many, uh, mostly African-American men, but it, it did, it, it, it served the wrong purpose, you know? And uh, that's what we got to fight against next. And, and also the right to vote. My great grandfather was 98 when he passed away, talked about how, and that's probably where apathy in our family came about by not voting because he couldn't vote. So my grandmother and grandfather didn't think it was important to vote, but that's the most powerful thing that we have is the right to vote. Uh, and, you know, we got to take advantage of that. I want to ask Coach uh, Davis and Coach Izzo um, this question. Given the times right now and student athletes being a lot different than they were uh, 20 years ago, maybe even 10 years ago. Uh, how will your coaching methods, how will your manners of motivation change or will they change moving forward? Well, my motivation, I put it all back to Texas Southern. I've been at all three levels. And I mean, well, what you guys were talking about earlier about the education, right here, I think that's fine. But until you know uh, how it feels to our leaders, not just the black leaders, but the white leaders, understand how we feel, it's going to be hard for things to change. And I'll give you an example. When I get stopped by a police officer, or when a black person gets stopped by a police officer, they're trying to do everything they can not to give up or give them any kind of indication that they're doing something to get the chops. My older son, uh, who lived in Birmingham, he got the, he got a gun pulled in twice by police officers. The white person was pulled over by the police officer. They worry about their insurance is going to go up. So, you know, with, with the George Floyd situation coming out, now we have more white people who who really understand and I think we understand it a little better because George Floyd's friend, Stephen Jackson, who the NBA guy within the media. 
and it just took off. But until the leaders of both until the leaders of the white races, until people that are in situations understand how it feels, then it's really hard to motivate. It's really hard to get. Again, when I see a photo of the pass by, I'm gonna make sure I put my signal light on. I'm making sure everything's perfect. Yeah. A white guy get pulled over, is this insurance? My insurance gonna go on. And so, you know, it's what we said earlier. My mom told me I had to be twice as good as a white boy. We still say the same thing in 2020. We still say we got we're not, I'm not telling my son he gotta be really, really, really good. I'm telling my son he gotta be twice as better. You know, coaching wise. Uh when 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 you're a black coach, they compare you to the best black coach you've ever been. It's not the coaches you're going against. It's, it's the John Thompson. It's the Noah Richardson. Uh, we always can pray until the white leaders understand that. It's going to be hard for anything to change. You know, and, 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 and I've motivated my kids at Texas Southern. That's the best job I've ever had because at Texas Southern, all black school, and we got our hands dirty. Uh, I was able to be really honest with them. When we go on a trip, the bus that they give us is not the same bus they would give to Michigan State, to North Carolina, Kansas. They give us the regular bus they can give us because we're calling in as Texas Southern. And, and we're not calling in to North Carolina. So again, that person over that bus line, he has to understand and see that, okay, it's Texas Southern is a black school. We're going to send them the same bus, the same bus driver that they were sent to a big school. And until we get people to understand that, until we get them to understand that part of it, it's going to be very hard. You know, we got black AD, black president here at, at Detroit, but we still got white administrators that don't understand our kids. And so until they understand our kids, I'll give you an example. My son was in summer school. The academic person told him, to go to your advisor, go to your advisor. And she's an academic person. So she said, well, just take a class, take a history class. It doesn't matter if it's towards his major or not. She's telling the head coaches on that. But what, what, what she's telling the regular school? You know, until she understands it. And, and see, see, the problem, I think, is just my opinion, my opinion only. Until, like Tom Izzo, I've been knowing Coach Izzo for a long time, you know. Tom Izzo don't need to wear no black life shirt matters. Now he's proven with his staff, Mike Gollum, and job bringing back all those guys. You know, until you understand what it feels, then you can't do the best anything that's going on. We can learn all the black history that we want to learn. They can learn all the black history. But what I'm still telling you, you got to be twice as better. Uh, when, 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 when you see the police coming, you straighten up and, and you act like, it's never going to change for us. That's just my opinion and my opinion alone because we need white people in high positions to speak up for black people that they know, that they know are good people and get the job done. Every time I see these people talking about we got a program to mentor black people, to do it, it, it's to qualify because they don't need mentors. They need opportunity, and then they need people to speak up for this, you know. And so that's that's my motive. I've always told my parents that you watch the bus they send us, you watch the bus driving. They say they send us bus driving. That's us direct. <laughs> and so they would never do that to a big time white school or a big time coach. So that's my viewpoint of it, and that's the way I see it. Uh, because again, I've coached all three levels. I coached at black schools, mid major, and I've also coached at the high level. And so I understand it. I've seen it from a different view. I'm from a small town with Georgia white people. So it don't take me but 20 minutes to speak to a white person, know where he's coming from. He don't know I know, but I know where he's coming from. Just through his conversation. You know, and, and, and until we speak up for people, for us, because like Coach Casey said, he can't say Because when we said we was an angry black guy, and it's just like the search. 
No, I was a basketball knock on Kenton. We have a search firm behind the president, behind the AD, behind the coach. So where do we fit in in that in that list of people? They don't fit in. You know, they want us to go have dinner and lunch with a church firm person. They should be having lunch with all that stuff. You know, so again, this is my opinion, my opinion on. No, your, your your opinion is your opinion is is, is, is valued. Trust me. But when you don't have a Greg Campy, a Tom Izzo, or somebody in that room that's gonna speak up for you, because I'm known as I don't like white people, I don't like to fly. And I know I'm gonna take tell you, we had three years of none, not not one home game. We from everywhere, you know. So I'm this guy, I'm that guy, I'm that guy. But when you speak your mind and speak what you think. They look at you differently. If you don't have somebody over there in those rooms and and, and, and and speaking up for you, it's a lost cause. That's just my opinion. Well, that's the reason why I feel like this is different because when you look at the 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 the, the marches, in some cases, they are there are more white people there than there are people of color. That's mm -hmm. why this is different. The the voices that you are now hearing that are voicing their opinions and their outrage and their disgust and their desire for change. Those faces are all different colors. Those faces, those those ethnic ethnic groups are, are varied. That's why I think this is different. Uh, but along with that difference that we speak of, uh, they're, they're going, they're, they're, a lot of change will be, I think, uh, uh, in front of us. That's why I was asking the question about, you know, how will you as coaches go about doing your jobs uh, moving forward, you got a different mindset. You've got a different ideology, even with the the, uh, the young athletes. You know, they're 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 they are more in tune, mm -hmm. and they're more willing to speak up, and they're more willing to take chances, and they're not afraid to, uh, in some cases, to have their platforms taken away. Uh, that's not going to quiet them down. You don't have that uh, that 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 weapon of, to hold against them now. Uh, Coach Izzo, I was asking you to comment. Yeah, well, you know, I, I think it's interesting, and I love what Mike said. You know, I, I agree with him. That's why I think a lot of this falls on us. I really do. And 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 you know what? I open that up warmly. I, I think the one thing that I've learned is, you know, when I talk to Garland all the time, he keeps it simple, you know. Treat someone like you'd want to be treated, but you got to hold people accountable still, too. And I think if you ask me what do I try to do the best, I get blessed because I've been in the same place. You know, with Gus Kanakis, Judd Heathcote, and me, that's 52 years. And because of that, I got to know the Greg Kelsers and Magic Johnsons or Johnny Greens. And we brought people back. And I, I know you, all, you you guys are doing it. You haven't been at the same place as long. Can't you have, but as far as the rest of you. And I, I think that if you show a guy that you love him and you care about him, and we say to our little kids in camp, maybe we got to do a little better job of learning to listen, but listening to learn. And I think if we learn to listen more, because as coaches, as head coaches, as bosses, you usually want to speak more and listen less. And I think what I've learned in the last couple of years is maybe to listen more and speak less. But those chairs behind me, I can't tell you the meetings I have in here at 12, 1 o'clock in the morning. I try to do things off the wall. I try to take a guy out for a ride, grab him something to eat late at night after a, a road game and, and just listen to what he has to say. And I think, like Mike, everybody sees my demeanor as one way. They don't see the behind-the-scenes things. And once you get a guy to trust you, which is hard nowadays, it's hard to get – but you got to spend time. And you get him to trust you, man, those kids will run through a brick wall for you. And, I think of the number of African-American families that not only have invited me into their house in the Flints and Detroit's and Chicago's and Saginaw's, but embraced it. And we all the same decency to them. And I'm just excited about where we are. I agree with you, Greg. I would be frustrated about the 400 years. I would be frustrated, Juwan, if I grew up like you did and, and Mike and Dwayne. I would be frustrated. The one thing I'm learning, though, we can learn from the past, but we can't live in the past. And I like that we saw it wasn't only white people, Hispanic people, black people, arm in arm, 
But it was old people, young people, rich people, poor people. This is the first time I really felt like we hit everybody. And I watched those so much closer. And sure, I, I, I don't like the writing, but I understand it. I understand it a little bit more. I, I looked at Colin Kaepernick taking a knee, and I, I didn't love it. But then I started to understand it, that peaceful protest. God, it meant so much now that I said, why can he kneel in front of a flag? And white people in my era, you're our great, you're our Dwayne, you know, back there in the late 60s, early they were burning the flag. And it just kind of made me realize how screwed up this whole thing is. And I'm going to be better for it, but I'm going to listen a little bit more. You all talked about education. It really frustrates my assistant, Mike Garland. We have black kids, and you all said it. They barely know who Martin Luther King is. I mean, so one of you said that we're not educating. I think it was you, Juwan, you know, black kids don't even know sometimes. We got to do a better job educating everybody. And uh, I hope to be a part of that. I really do. It's uh, the kids I've had have done a lot for me. And now it's time for me to do not only something for them, but their families and their future families and kids. And that's the goal. That's the mission. Mm -hmm. Guys, you know, um, one, one of my friends is Dr. Harry Edwards, um, the noted um, sociologist and, and civil rights activist who has been active since the 70s, uh, actually since the 60s. And I met him, Tom, I met him in 2009 in Detroit when Michigan State was in the final four here in Detroit. I uh, moderated a panel which he and uh, Bill Russell and a few others were a part of. And uh, not only was I honored, I was in awe to be uh, in the company of such uh, uh, civil rights icons, if you will. But I spoke with him last week and sometimes he, you know, he, I, I, will, I will chime in with him because he helps me with my own compass. And uh, he helps me to make sure I'm pointing myself in the right direction in my effort to be uh, someone who makes a difference. And we got into a little conversation about the difference between progress and change. And I was telling him a story about how when I came back to the country in 1968 after living two years in Asia as uh, with my military family. And when I got back to the United States uh, in 1968, July, uh, the country was absolutely on fire. There were riots every place. There were, there was, there were, there were, there were demonstrations. It was three months after Martin Luther King had been slain. It was one month after Robert Kennedy, a Democratic presidential hopeful, was murdered in Los Angeles. And uh, there was unrest everywhere. And I made the comment that, you know, little has changed. There hasn't been any progress uh, because we're still doing that same thing today. And uh, Dr. Edwards, he corrected me. He says, no, 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 don't confuse the two. They're different. Uh, progress you know, means that you're heading in, in a positive direction. And, and it's that progress that has allowed, that allowed us to, to, to have an African-American family in the White House in 2008 to 2016. Now change is a different thing because change is to alter something or to make it different, but it doesn't always mean that that difference is good. So that's where he says right now, change has to come through really the changing of mindsets, the changes of ideologies, the changes of, red, of, of stereotypes and, and, and beliefs. And that is the biggest hurdle now to really, really uh, enjoy progress and, and have that sustained over a long period of time. And that to me seems to be one of the most difficult things with Dr. Uh, Edwards, as long as he's been in this fight and in this struggle, assured me that it's not uh, uh, something that in vain, that it is still worth hoping, it's still something worth striving for. So in having you know conversations like we're having now, and I know Coach Davis, you know you, I, I feel your, I feel your energy, I feel your passion, uh, and I agree with the things that you're saying. But again, that's why I reiterate, I think this could be different because now the voices that need to to be heard are willing to speak out and are willing to be uh, risk risk takers if that's the case, in an effort to do the right thing. Well, I'll, I'll say this, and, and like you said, you know, it goes back to what Mike said, and it's hard to feel that, you know, it, it, for us who didn't go through what he exactly went through, 
at Indiana, at Texas, all those schools is hard. But again, I feel the passion, but being able to say that in 2020 is, is what's so important now. We can, you can speak your mind, don't worry about repercussions. And if you just touch one heart, just one touch one heart, one mind, and to try to change that. Uh, I think that's what these conversations are about, or I know in the NBA, that, that's one thing every day, when, once the season starts back, they're gonna talk about something on this platform just so we don't lose it, uh, lose the momentum going forward. And again, you're not gonna give me an example. When I wrote that letter, Greg, someone on one of the, I don't, I didn't even read it, but my, someone was, my wife's friend saw it, said, don't teach your son to, uh, you know, try to cash 20, fake $20 bills and he won't get killed or arrested. Teach your son not to be a thug. So there's still a lot of hearts and minds out there because you got people still out there feeling that way about a nine-year-old kid. You know, you've got some sick people who, who haven't changed their heart. And some of those, you're probably not going to change. But what we got to do is touch the young adolescents, the young people in which I think we're doing. Maybe not fast enough, but I think we're touching some of their hearts and minds. Uh, you know, we still have a lot of work to do from that standpoint. Coach so I have a quick question for you, and, and I have one for you as well, uh, Coach Howard, uh, and I'm going to call you Coach Howard. Um, one of the things that really impressed me, and you did come to me, you did uh, reach out to me to, to, to help in any way I could in your effort to try to, to be better and, and, and be a better steward for, for the change that we all seek. But uh, I, I remember being impressed with the fact that many, many years ago on your coaching staff at Michigan State, you didn't have one uh, African-American assistant or two, you had three. I, I, I'd never seen that before and I've never seen that since. Did you catch flack for that? You know, I didn't. I, I can honestly say I didn't. Uh, there were three good guys. They were all from the state. Uh, two of them played here, and one was my best friend since college. And, uh, or maybe I wasn't hearing it, to be honest with you, Frank, because maybe I didn't care. You know, I, I, I talked to a couple of people up here, uh, African-American people. I said, you know, are you at all concerned? And I wasn't. And, uh, you know, it was a great time for me. I'd do it again. Um, and I, I, I do got to say one thing, though, Greg, to bring a little humor to this thing, as far as Mike Davis and that bus he rode in, well, I'd like to have to, I'd like to be driving that bus because he drove into East Lansing and kicked our butt. <laughs> <laughs> and so whoever that driver is, just send him my way. I could use a little help. <laughs> he already kicked it once, but – we squeaked out a couple after that, so I know how he could coach. I know he was in Indiana, and I just, uh, I just think we all got to do more. You know, this is an incredible, way this is incredible what you're doing. And uh, you know, Jamon, you and I, Michigan, Michigan State, we're always feuding now as far as the rivalries. Maybe we should do something together, you know, and and just bring everybody together because I do like the momentum we have. But I've heard you all say it, and I say it to my guys. I made my team watch the George Fuller thing. None of you have seen it. Incredible. Tommy Amaker sent it to me. Um, I made my team, and I'm testing them tomorrow. I was going to watch it together, and I said, I'm going to see who will watch it and who will pick up something. And it, it was really good. And I, I think if we do more together, we can still compete on the floor. But remember, we're trying to help players. We're all going after the same players, and we're trying to help those guys. And I think uh, this was a great format to start it, and they've all been awesome. So like, like Juwan said, Duane, I want to thank you. Um, this is a privilege. It's an honor, and it's, and it's going to help. I, I promise you. Juwan, do you, have, do you feel like at, at Michigan you have the support to do the things that you believe, the things that you want to do? To, uh, to bring about change, being a young coach um, so early in your in your career, do you feel you have that? I mentioned what I mentioned about Coach Izzo a moment ago because I think that risk that he took, though he says he didn't catch a lot of flag for it 10, 12 years ago when it happened, but that's the type of stuff, that's the type of gutsy stuff that it's going to take now moving forward to Mike Davis's point. But, Juwan, do you feel like you have that 
freedom at the University of Michigan to just go in and, and, and do your own thing, uh, be the leader that you want to be, uh, have the people around you that you want to have, uh, make the differences that you want to make. You know, Greg, I'm happy you're asking me this question because, you know, like, obviously I'm, I'm one of the, I'm the only black head coach in the Big Ten. And I'm one of the few black head coaches in the Power Five Conference. Also, I was a former basketball player at the University of Michigan, part of Fab Five. And during that time, looking back to when I was a part of Fab Five, I remember when Coach Fisher received some of those letters from boosters, from a lot of folks in the Michigan area about Coach Fisher stepping out and starting five black players on the court at one time, and they all happened to be freshmen. He took a lot of flack for that, in which I admire and respect him that he had his vision, he trusted his vision, and and he didn't care or think what anyone had to say. Truly, in his heart, I'm sure he probably had some type of, like, you know, backfield feeling, but in some type of sleepless nights. But then now, let's fast forward. I'm the head coach, and I know I have one person in my corner for sure, and that's our AD, and his name is Ward Manning. I know Ward well. A gentleman that took a chance on me uh, being a coach that was – not a head coach before that had, did not have the head coaching experience. Um, a part of the Fab Five, but, uh, where the banners and the record books are not in the school right now. It, it's like it doesn't exist. But he stepped out and he said, you know what? This is our guy. So getting back to your question, I don't trust and believe I do. But I tell you one thing that I'm going to work my tail off and I'm going to make sure that I work hard. I be the best leader I can be. Um, put our kids in a position to graduate and get a degree from the University of Michigan. Help teach and develop them on the court, off the court, to be young men, to be young leaders in their community. Um, that's what I feel I'm winning right there. Yes, we all want to win a national championship. That's my goal someday to be a head coach, to be be able to cut down a net, you know, and then of course pass the the scissors over to one of my players and let him cut down the net so he can remember that for a lifetime. But getting back to the fact that, you know, is it, the support there for me? Um, I'm not going to worry about that. You know, I know that I have a mission. I have a dream. And I'm, I'm and this is where my God has put me in a position to be in a, a, a position to develop and, and, and have an impact on these young men's lives. And so I can't get up into worrying about who's supporting me and who's not. You know, I'm, I'm focusing on our, I'm protecting these young men, making sure that they get the proper and the best education, keeping them safe right now, because let's not forget we're in, the, we're in this pandemic, keeping them safe, keeping them healthy. And then all the other stuff, as far as, you know, if I got a booster that's upset because of my coaching style, it's totally different from the guy that I, that that I took over, who was, you know, uh, uh, a fan favorite. Uh, the, the state of Michigan loved him, and he had great success. And I'm so happy. I was a fan of Coach B and everything he's done. I'm not Coach B. I'm not going to try to be Coach B. I'm going to be me. You know, that was one of the things that I recall when I when I was uh, working on becoming a head coach, and uh, I had a, a great coach like Eric Spolster who helped develop me, become a, a head coach someday. And as I'm taking notes and I'm learning, um, I never forget. I forget which coach it was told me, whenever you become a head coach, be you. Don't try to be Eric. Don't try to be Pat Riley. Don't try to be any coach that you play for. Your players will respect you more if you're yourself. That's why I'm always transparent with my guys. You know, that's why even my players know that I am for them. And we are a family. And that brotherhood, you know, and I still sometimes think like I'm a player because that's like when you once was a player, you know, and, and playing on that level before, you still have a soft spot in your mind. Not like I'm trying to get on the court and try to feel like I can still perform at that level, but because of my mindset. My mindset hasn't changed over quite yet. But I know I'm a their head coach, but the respect level is there, and I want to earn their trust. 
Well, you know what? That 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 mindset or that thought process that you can still do it, that'll probably never go away. Just as Tom is though, he's still shooting free throws every day. I sit there broadcasting NBA games. I haven't played a game in 30 years. I still feel like I can get out there at times. Gentlemen, what I would like to do now as we bring this to a close, I want to give each one of you uh, 45 seconds to one minute to just close with the comments that you want to uh, bring forth. And then, Coach Casey, I'll, I'll give it to you to uh, sort of wrap things up uh, as, our, or, as, our, as, as this is your brainchild. Um, I think it's only appropriate to do that. So we'll just go around the uh, around the field here. And Coach Izzo, again, we'll start with you, and then we'll go with Mike. Uh, 45 seconds, one minute, Coach. Well, I just want to thank everybody, and I want to say that uh, the theme seems to be uh, let's not make this uh, Groundhog Day. Let's not make this the same as it's been year after year. Because I sat through a little bit of those 68 riots, too, and and saw what it did to Detroit. And now when you see the same thing happening, that's our fault. I, I look at that as that's our fault. So I'm going to try to uh, to do my job, and I'm going to try to learn from you guys. And anybody's got some advice, um, this isn't a dictatorship. And I just want to get better at what I do and help kids, help this state, help this university uh, become something. I'm going to remind everybody, since I'm not a big political guy, but I am a medical guy. Wear your mask. <laughs> <laughs> Wear your mask. Hey, hey, hey coach, I, I, I love that. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. yeah, mine's never far from me. Coach Mike Davis. And uh, okay. I, I want to I want to wish you and those Titans all the best. Uh, this whenever whenever things start back up. But go ahead, coach. We appreciate it. Coach Casey first. Thank you for, for having me on. Um, Again, I hope in my lifetime I see the changes that we need to have for uh, uh, my grandkids, my kids to be able to uh, compete in this world on an even playing ground. So uh, I've been through this so many times and died out so many times. Uh, my passion for it is it, it runs deep. Well, I'm really quiet at times. I don't say a whole lot because I know how my passion goes. But I just pray to God that my grandkids can see a change uh, in this world. Thank you, Coach. Coach Campy. Well, Dwayne, thank you uh, for letting me be part of this. Right. You know, I sat down when it started and I thought for sure I knew the answers and now listening to all this, I know I'm farther the way, away than I was. You know, I, I thought education, education, but I hear what Mike has to say. I hear what Dwayne has to say and, and Juwan. And, and, you know, I, the big thing is, is we've all been told someday in our life that you're either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. And I want to be part of the solution. Um, uh, the past is the past. We've learned from it, but we have to keep this movement going and not let it be a moment, not let it be a moment in time, but the catalyst of, of real change occurring. And we at Oakland University, our players, our staff, our administration has, has really talked in depth about this. And we all agree we want to be part of the solution. So that's what we're here for. Thank you, Coach. Coach Howard. Well, first of all, like I said earlier, uh, I want to thank Coach Casey for allowing me to be a part of this, this panel. Um, it's a great opportunity to be here in front of you coaches and to learn. Um, I've always been told that listening is a skill. And uh, I learned that from my high school basketball coach. And that has never left. So this is a time to listen. Yes, but it's also a time of action. And it hurts my heart to see the racism that's happening right now across the world, but more importantly here in this country. Um, in my personal opinion, and I speak from the heart, and also I speak for many when I say this, um, there has to be a change come November. And our players, you know, it started with the, our kids who haven't had the chance to vote. I encourage them to go out there and vote. Um, I have had all my players register. Um, for them to be able to uh, voice their opinion and, and also to 
um, help with this change and they're all on board. I encourage everyone out there who hasn't had a chance to vote, to register to vote. Uh, this is going to really help impact the change. It has to start at the top and the leadership. And the leadership right now, uh, in my in my opinion, uh, the leadership is not acting as a leader. And that has hurt my heart more than anything because, you know, I get emotional thinking about it because our kids are looking at it. And you talk about changing the mindset. You know, there are some that are agreeing with the leadership and it's creating a big divide within our country. And so that divide is creating a big problem. And in order for us to move to solutions, it has to start at the top. So I, that's what my heart is. I'm a big advocate of it. And I like to see it happen. So vote November 3rd. <laughs> Amen to that, John. Well said and uh, very well said. And I think it is important that all people get out and vote, be heard. Mm -hmm. Coach Casey, let me take this opportunity to thank you as well for allowing me to be a part of this as well. And uh, it is definitely my honor to be in the midst of all of you fine gentlemen, great coaches. Uh, thank you for your contributions to uh, to the development of our young people and, uh, and, and older people as well. Coach Casey, you have the floor. Well, I, again, I wanna thank everybody here, Tom, Juwan, Greg, Mike, and Greg, uh, for being a part of this. This was, I was thinking about different things once, uh, we were going through this, but uh, it goes back to one thing. It, you know, I think Tom talked about uh, Colin Kaepernick. You know, at that time, peaceful protest took a knee. It wasn't to disparage the flag. It wasn't to put, put down our country. It was about police brutality. It was about you know standing up for, for justice. In our, in our country. But again, everybody changed the narrative to make it look like he was doing something bad against our country. He was fighting for, he was peacefully protesting exactly for what happened to George Floyd, to mm -hmm. Maude Aubrey, Brianna Taylor in my state of Kentucky. All those things, and I think that's why we're so emotional right now, and I think this time will be different. It's because we saw it, you know, we saw public lynchings. I mean, I, I would can't put it any other way. Public lynchings, and in today's technology, you can't you can't hide from it. And what I pray, I pray that our justice system works because if it doesn't, Tom, you talked about the rioting and all that. It, it's going to be crazy, and I don't want to see that as an American citizen, as an African American. You know, I want justice to be served. Uh, and I think that's the only way peacefully we can, can stay together. Like Jawan said, right now we're divided. We're divided. Those same guys I fought in elementary school, we're friends now. But all the rhetoric is coming out of the White House, it's not right. Whether you're Republican or Democrat, it doesn't matter. We're human beings. It's a human being problem. And let's get it together. And the only way we can cover that is to vote. We brought Stacey Abrams in to speak to our entire organization. And you're talking about being someone who should be bitter. This young lady won, she basically won the state of Georgia's uh, governorship. But somehow, some way, they lost registration forms, they lost votes. She only got beat by 50,000 votes. So she took it on herself to start fighting for, uh, to fight against voter suppression. And uh, that's something we have the power and the privilege and the right to do is to vote. If we get the right people in, in office, whether it's in the highest office of our land, Senate, you know, uh, House of Representatives, state legislature, governorship, those are the way we can change all these educational pieces that we see that are wrong now, is to vote. The power to vote it is a very powerful thing to get the right mayor in, to get the right uh, people in a, at the local level, the grassroots level. Those things are so important right now. And as a coach, you know, I've been in a long time. I want to win a national championship, but I want to leave, leave a legacy in the Detroit area by trying to do what's right for everybody. With his kids, we're we having a program going with Chief Craig uh, here, 
to work with some of the challenged police officers and the challenged kids in the community, trying to bring them together where if a policeman sees a kid, his first instinct is not to shoot him. His first instinct is to talk to him. Hey, Johnny, hey, you, I, I know you from the program. We, you know, we work together. We went to a Pistons game together. You know, what's wrong? What's the problem? You know, but I think right now, not only all around the world, the first option, the first instinct is to shoot the kid. And that's uh, that we have to change that mindset as well. So we have a lot of work to do, but one power we have is to vote. Again, I want to thank Tom and Greg because I'm going to say this from my heart. It takes white men like you to speak up and speak out, you know, and sometimes it's uncomfortable. Sometimes it's very uncomfortable. And that's the level of, of, of feelings we have to get over. Just like you said, Greg, what you said, Tom, we have to get out of that comfort level because right now, until the George Floyd killing and lynching, everybody was comfortable. We could say what we wanted to say at the golf course. We could say what we want to say to our friends and no repercussions. But now if I hear something, I'm going to say something. And I hope we all do that and, and keep people on their toes until we get this thing changed around. And it's not going to happen overnight. That bus driver, Mike, that you had in Texas Southern probably still going to get the worst bus of them all next year. And so, but again, at least now we can talk about it. They know how you feel about it. They know how Juwan and Greg feels about it and Greg Kelser feels about it. And we just got to keep keep the momentum going and uh, and doing it the right way. And again, it's going to be uncomfortable, but it's something we got to continue to strive for. And that's my mission. Uh, and again, like Tom said, I still got to win basketball games. But as an African-American man who has African-American kids, who have African-American cousins, aunts, uncles, I have the duty to my family, to my race, to my people, and to everybody I know to fight for what's right in the right way. And uh, that's what this is part of. And it, it's anything we can do, I can do to help you, Greg, Tom, or you, Jerron, anybody to, to, for information you might need. Uh, please, please, I'm a phone call away. Well, again, thank you all. I want you to understand that uh, my respect to you is 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 clear. Uh, the jobs that you do as a, as 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 coaches, as leaders, but also understanding that it goes beyond just the basketball and the wonderful opportunities that you have to be impactful in the lives of people and sports. There is sometimes, oftentimes, no greater vehicle for that. You think about people right now, millions and millions and millions of people in this country just chomping at the bit for, for their sports, for their basketball, for their football, for their baseball, all of that, for their hockey, and so on and so forth. But when they get it, when they come back, it's important that we all continue to put our mes message out there and to not be quieted because sports has a way of power to change people, I think, to change minds. And yes, sometimes it will be risky. Sometimes it will be a little uncomfortable, but it's our responsibility, I believe, to do that. I applaud you all because it's clear by your very presence here on this Zoom call tonight, on this Zoom meeting, that you understand just how important that this time is in our careers and in this country. I wanna thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good job. Good job, Greg. Thank you, everybody.